What happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? Hi, I'm Brent Cassidy. Welcome to the Nightmare Success In and Out podcast, where we explore how to overcome your fears and nightmares and set yourself free. We're going to be exploring this topic with guys that was in Leavenworth with and others who survived their own nightmare. These stories can be inspiring, sometimes sad. There's some humor, but hopefully you can come away with a nugget of something that'll help you knock down some of the prisons you built up in your own mind. All right, welcome back, Nightmare Success listeners. You guys come here for what happens when your worst fear becomes your reality. How do you adapt, survive, overcome, set yourself free? I've got a good guy here today, Rick Gray. And, you know, we talk about on this show about reentry and how hard reentry is and how do you get back. And the, and the numbers are so bad, you know, that, that you've got 75% going back in five years. And why is that? Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact if you can't pl- find a place to live, you can't find a job, you can't find support, you fall back into bad routines that le- leads you down the wrong path to where you came, came from before. Well, Rick, he's got a really interesting story, and, and we'll get into all this, but he's he's created a nonprofit. It's all about reentry. It's about housing. He takes guys in and uh, guys who's been in prison and teach them the trade of carpentry. And it's, it's just a, it's an incredible story of what he's doing and his commitment to it, his passion for it. Can't wait to get into all that. But before we do that, I want to recognize our sponsor, Auto Plaza Direct. You know, who likes spending a couple of weekends walking lots looking for a car? Then you spend like four or five hours in the dealership to buy a car. Well, this is kind of like a trip to a dentist. Well, there's a better way to take away all this pain and hassle of getting a car. Auto Plaza Direct. They are your personal car concierge. Just tell them the car you want, what you can pay, and they'll go find that car for you. They'll negotiate your best price. They'll deliver that car to wherever you are. They'll also offer you warranties and financing. It's full service. Go to autoplazadirect.com to get started with your personal car concierge. The new hassle-free way, the car buying experience you deserve, Auto Plaza Direct. Tell them Brent from Nightmare Success sent you. All right, folks, let's get into this. Rick, man, welcome. Thank you. Brent. Thank, Glad thanks, to be here. For, thanks for coming, man. I love your story and I love what you're doing. It's um, so many times people talk about, you know, well, if you could just help the guys, you know, when they get back. And really, you find that uh, that's a lot of talk a lot of times. And I think what's really cool about what you're doing, you're, you're using your experience and we'll get into that about how you, you went through your world and then came to where you are now. But the fact that you're using what you know through your journey and then creating a system for these guys to work through and, and stay on the right path is, is very, very cool. Very, very cool. So let's go back, Rick. Where did you come from? What was what was Rick doing growing up as a kid? Mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of the <clears throat> kind of the same thing I say every time. I you know I spent a lot of my adolescent uh, youth as a young man uh, partying, <laughs> drinking, doing drugs, getting in trouble. Um, I say you know from about the age of sixteen to thirty, I was either in jail, on probation, or I had a court date. That's a good yeah, span yeah. there, yeah. A lot of, a lot of uh, criminal justice experience. That was really my life growing up, yeah, in and out, in and out of county jails. So, Rick, when you say that, were you the only guy out of your friend group that was going through this, or yeah. were you in a group that was kind of experiencing all this together? It seemed like it was, I was the only guy. <laughs> <laughs> you were the one with the bad luck. <laughs> yeah. Now, I never felt unlucky. I, I always had a... A sense deep down that uh, I knew what I was doing was not right. Yeah. Um, but if I look at where I, you know, if I if I think about the source of that, mm-hmm. right, it had to do with my insecurity. Yeah. It had to do with just the lack of support from my father, and not, you know, it was either punishment or mm-hmm. not being there, basically. And I just was so acutely insecure. Did and you recognize that at the time, or was this something you reflected on looking back at it? I, I didn't recognize it as being that. I was spending so much time feeding that, mm-hmm. doing things to not feel that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where the drugs came in. And how did you get into it? How did you? How did it happen? 
Well, so, um, I, you know, I guess, you know, going back to high school, um, I never felt like I fit in. Did you have siblings? I have two younger sisters, okay. so I'm two, the oldest. Okay, you're the oldest. Yeah. Uh, okay, One that sisters. bears the brunt. Yes. The experiment. Uh-huh, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so my dad had actually been to prison when he was a when he was young. Interesting. He sat me down when I was about... We both had that in common. Yeah. He sat me down when I was in fourth grade and told me that he had done uh, 18 months in Hutchison, Kansas when he was 16. Wow. For breaking in houses. And I knew from that moment forward I was going to prison. Really? Which is, I mean, there's a, there's a psychiatry principle there where yeah. you sort of follow. Yeah. I just felt like that was, and sure enough, it, it ended mm-hmm. up happening. In fact, I, I ended up in the very prison he was in mm. um, for a couple of days mm-hmm. <clears throat> in the process. But um, so uh, him not being around, not, getting, not having the support, not feeling <clears throat> uh, a part of the group. I felt like I was always trying to get into the popular group. Yeah. I wasn't smaller than anybody. But no, I, you're tall. But I felt like I how, was. How tall are you? Six four. Yeah, I mean, so was but you I that? wasn't tall in high school. Okay, yeah, that happened. You're one like, of those guys that freaked yeah. everybody out yes. afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> I, I got a friend like Don Davis. He said he was like five six, uh, five foot six, five foot seven, and nobody really recognized him because he grew when he was in college, and now he's like six four. Yeah, <clears throat> that happened my junior year. <clears throat> um, but you know, going through that process, and then you know. I, I just hated high school I, because of that. Yeah. I just despised it because it's all about the popularity right. component, right? Yeah. And so when I got out of high school, I grew. I started getting attention from women. Yeah. I never experienced that. Yeah. And that really was my drug. Uh-huh. And I started going to the bars, started partying, and I was off to the races. That from, was intoxicating, yeah. that whole thing. Oh, yeah. So, and, and, and I think if you, you were telling me that um, you went to college for a little while, like a year or so, but then you fell into, back into the family business, right? Yeah. Okay. So how did that all work out? Well, I tried it. I tried the community college thing and, you know, there'd be days I'd be driving home thinking I, I didn't go to one class. <laughs> <laughs> like, what if, well, that's pretty common this though. This doesn't make any You're sense. Not, <laughs> a lot of people at Mizzou said I, I'm... Yeah. Driving back, thinking I didn't go one class me. today. Um, you know, whatever, however my brain works, it just, it just, uh, it wasn't for me, and it didn't work. So I got into the family furniture business, yeah, uh, into the sales part of it, selling furniture. <clears throat> my dad had actually gone out of town one weekend, and I took a customer. I'd never done that. I was basically the guy, the delivery guy, yeah. right? I'm 16, 17, whatever, and I sold them a dining room set. You felt that rush. And then I started doing add-ons, like uh-huh. table leaves and things that were already included. I, You know, it's like yeah. I found my niche, right? <laughs> so I was uh, I was in, you know, sole furniture for many years in the family business, out of the house. We did it out of the house. Yeah. And uh, and then did that for a few years. And then I, end, you know, because of my, my partying and my drug use, I ended up stealing from my family. Yeah. Significant amount of money, too. And... Uh, basically just drained the bank account. They f- found out about it. Like within an hour, they were at my door, pounding on the door. I gave them the money back. That was it for me for the furniture business. That was it. Yeah. That's and your I'm drug doing. of choice? Cocaine. Yeah. yeah. Which probably in the sales business kept you running. Never did it during the daytime. Just Never, to, just. No. To, oh, was, that's right. You said that you, you would just go out and say, I'm not doing anything, have a few drinks. Yeah. And it would lead into that. Yeah, that really was the powerlessness of it, Yeah, right? I knew that it was causing me all of the problems that I was having. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I would go out at night trying to, f- you know, at, in, in my insecurity, trying to feed that. Mm-hmm. I'd end up drinking, which then, you know, turns that all the, yeah. you know, the Takes good decision makers off. Yeah. And then we're doing drugs before long, and now I'm writing bad checks. You know, my dad had some old company checks. I would forge those and... And that was sort of my thing was was uh, bad checks to support my habit. That was it, and that's what ended me up. In me, ended me. Glorious. So how did that happen when that when that nightmare landed on you and you're writing these bad checks? I guess you're assuming that that's that's a short term win. Sure. Uh, did they just come knock on your door one day and say, "Hey, by the way, Rick, you you written some bad checks. Come with us." Or what? What happened? Well, that's an interesting story because. Um, you know, I was becoming well known in my town in Kansas City, where I was from. Mm-hmm. I ended up on Kansas City's top ten most wanted list. Let's talk about that. 
for a probation violation. There sounds a lot scarier <laughs> it than it does. is. It does. It sounds. Uh, My dad called me and said, well, you made the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, when is this saga going to end? Yeah. But I, I should add... Um, and I'm going to probably talk about this a lot throughout as it relates to my own life, mm-hmm. as it relates to these guys that I try to help, and as it relates to why what we're doing is not working, mm-hmm. right? It's mm-hmm. one word, enable. Right. My father was never there growing up, but when my parents got divorced, he was there to the point of enabling, mm. to where he was paying for the lawyers. And to be fair, I was pretty convincing. Look, I'm I'm so sorry. Please help me. Yeah. Bail me out of this. I won't do it. And I meant I mean, to. well, it's a tough position for a parent. Yeah. You know, wanna you wanna help. Well, you know, what I realized years later, Brent, is that he really wasn't doing it for me. Mm-hmm. He was doing it to assuage guilt. Yeah. To not have his son sit in jail. Sure. Which was the hard that's why they call it tough love. Mm-hmm. Not because you're hard on the person, it's because it's tough to love that way. Mm-hmm. Right? So um, he enabled me. That's a good point. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. He enabled me for many years. And when it got too big, where he was just too much money, he couldn't afford it. He stopped. Boom. Got sober. Haven't drank use since 28 years. Mm. Now, I should say, I did have to go on to prison to drive that message home. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that had I not gone to prison, I'd be dead today. Mm. My body needed to go to that building. I needed to experience that. But just purely by God's grace and mercy, I, I only did four months on a four-year sentence. So mm. that, that was my wake-up call. So um, how did it come about? So you, you've, you're writing bad checks. Um, how did that happen? Did yeah. they, just, they just come to you and say, hey, Rick, by the way, you're writing bad checks. <clears throat> come down and we've got... No, that's a funny story. So um, <clears throat> I had uh, I'd gotten arrested for hitting a guy on a golf course. Oh, really? I was taking was steroids. Was just too slow? <laughs> he was too slow. He was too slow. <clears throat> I was taking steroids. I'm in my mid twenties at the point at that point, and we kind of got into it, and I ended up shoving him. And uh, by the time I got up to the clubhouse, there was twenty cops cars in the parking lot at the golf course. They arrested me. Went to jail, had to stay overnight and see the judge the next morning. Yeah. And, I mean, I I was in pretty good shape. It mm-hmm. didn't look good. The guy was an older guy. Mm-hmm. And so I ended up going through a process with him, a battery, through multiple court cases. Mm. And I got to the end, and he was at every court date. He wanted my behind. Yeah. Rightfully so. Yeah. I humiliated him in front of his friends. Yeah. Shoved him really hard to the point where he fell down and, like, did a somersault. Okay. And uh, so I get to this final court day and I get probation. And I had no, and I mean, it was, you know, that little door, that little turnstile that you walk through? Mm-hmm. That wasn't even closed behind me when I heard the prosecutor lean over to the guy and say, don't worry about it. We're going to charge him with felony forgery today. Oh, man. So I was out of trouble and back in worse trouble mm-hmm. in like 30 seconds. That meant they knew about the checks. Mm. They had put the dots together. Yeah. And I ended up turning myself in. And that started the process of, you know, I think I ended up on that case getting to one to five. And I did like 90 days, got released. Um, and then I and I tested positive again for drugs. And I stopped going to see my parole officer because I knew I was going to go to prison if mm-hmm. I did. Right. And in that period... I haven't talked about this stuff in a while. In that period, I got pulled over one night going to buy crack at 10 o'clock at night, driving 100 miles an hour down a street like Manchester here. Oh, wow. Got pulled over, <clears throat> knew I had warrants. For those down in the Cayman Islands listening, Manchester is a very busy street. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> very busy street, but not so much at 10 o'clock at night. Not at so night, All right. You stand out when yeah. you're doing 90 plus on Manchester. Yes. So I get pulled over. The The police officer comes over, gets my ID. He walks back. I take off. He chases me. I think I get away. I pull into the parking space where I was living in the apartment complex. I thought I got away. got inside. My girlfriend and I in there. Sat in there for about a half hour, 45 minutes. Nothing, nothing. We're good. Did the drugs all night. As soon as the sun came up, pounding on the door, I hear the walkie-talkies, the keys jingling. Mm -hmm. They're outside. And they said, well... We're just going to sit out here and wait for him. 
and I'm calling on my family, telling them I'm going away, and I've been doing drugs all night, so I'm not, I'm yeah, not, not right. feeling great. And I don't know, it was about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I just decided to just walk out of there. I did, got my car, and drove away. And I don't, to this day, I don't know how that happened. Wow. I, I don't know, because my girlfriend would go out there to take the trash. Oh, they're still out there. Yeah. Got away. We moved the next day, and then I went on to be on the run yeah. for 14 months. That's when I made the 14 top 10. months. 14 that's months that's, that's quite a while. As a, as a most wanted guy. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that was. And so, how did you get caught after 14 months? Um, so, <clears throat> it's funny because I've had two or three people on here that have <clears throat> been most wanted. That's Seth Ferrante and uh, Kyle Kilasing. Where it, being on the run's not easy. It's horrible. It's just, I mean, and there's times when I'm, and I always, I always in my heart wanted to do the right thing. Yeah, I think the message. For this stuff, for at least for me, someone with drugs and alcohols, it didn't matter how much you want to. I'm powerless over it. Yeah. I knew I would go to prison and did drugs anyway. If that yeah. isn't powerless, I don't know what is. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> so at the end of that 14 months, I had went out one night, got drugs, went back, stayed up two nights in a row. I'd never done that. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing things outside, the police, you know, open up, sheriff's department, which is none of it was real, right? Mm -hmm. It was all the paranoia. Right, paranoia. And I just, that, I couldn't take it. That was it. I turned myself in next, that Monday, got, you know, did six months in the county jail. Yeah. And then got released to a work release program, four months. Yeah. And in that four months, got sent to Dodge City, Kansas for 30, 30 days inpatient treatment. So I was off the street 11 months. Got released to an Oxford house and drank and used drugs within two weeks of being out. Wow. And it was a decision that well, I made. I was going to ask you about that because you, you're going through some treatment programs. Are you feeling different? Are you feeling like this is just a hassle that I'm having to do because these guys are putting me through this? No, that's a great question. Um, I always say that I, I legitimately wanted to stop. Like within like the year or two, what I really did Mm -hmm. But I couldn't. So when I was in treatment, I meant it. Mm -hmm. I thought I was good. I was taking it in. I was doing everything they asked. And that's always been the case with me. Like, you know, when I had checks, mm -hmm. I could have, I could have run up a million dollars. Right. End up, it ended up being 10 grand. Cause I just, it was enough to just be able to support. Goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I wasn't there trying to create a retirement plan. Right. You were just I supporting guilt. your habit. Yeah. I felt remorse. I knew I was doing the wrong thing. I would I would steal things and pawn them with my driver's license. Here's a felony. Here's where I live. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was all impulsive. Yeah, it was the impulsivity. I had of to have addiction. it right now. Yeah, <clears throat> and you could make the case that I wanted to get caught. Yeah, you know, you maybe really, you did. You, I, you maybe really you didn't could. know it, but maybe you did. Because yeah. <clears throat> you said it saved your life, so maybe you were, you were looking for something to to hold on to. It did, would... no doubt. But the but the variable is that I hadn't surrendered. Mm -hmm. And when I tested positive uh, again after doing that, after being off the street for 11 months, mm -hmm. I had I had. You said it was two weeks after that? I, well, I drank and used two weeks after, but I skated through a few of the tests. I beat it just guzzling yeah. water. And, yeah. and then what got me was <clears throat> my sobriety date is December 30th, 1994. That's a long time ago. That's New Year's Eve Eve, which is hilarious if you think about it. Pre-party, right? Slept yeah, right through New everything. Year's Eve. Exactly. <clears throat> but I got called in for a surprise <laughs> test that that Monday, two days later, and failed it. Yeah. And went in to see my PO, and she said, Rick, when are you going to get honest with me about your drug use? And it was, it was, I remember like it was yesterday. It was like the scales fell from my eyes. I couldn't believe that I had risked this that I, I knew these judges wouldn't give me another chance mm. and I did it anyway and she said you know I started you know trying to give her my sales she said I don't want to hear it <clears throat> I'll see you get two months before your first court date your actions will speak mm. and I had done a lot of AA meetings NA meetings court ordered stuff treatment twice mm. I had a lot of experience with it <clears throat> but I wasn't all in I was half measuring, as we say. I was yeah. doing the parts I wanted to do, not doing the parts I didn't want to do. 
and not being honest. Mm-hmm. And that's why I was not getting sober. That's why I wasn't staying sober. Yeah. <clears throat> and so when I went to prison, that was different. I had a moment. Um, <clears throat> I'd gone to an AA meeting in the county jail waiting to go to my first revocation hearing, looking at four years in prison. So I had all the pressure you could imagine. Thinking about all that. All that on my back. It was a great motivator, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I had this moment where I came back to my cell, and I, I just remember they closed the door, and it has that little glass window, and I saw my reflection, and it struck me the difference between how smart I was, thought I was, mm-hmm. And how nothing I had ever done had worked. And just just the universe in between those two points. And I literally just turned around, fell to my knees, which I had done a million times before. Mm-hmm. Crisis Christian foxhole prayers, right? Yeah. This was different. This was, you know, I give. I surrender. My way is not working. I admit it. I'm an alcoholic ad. I admit it to you, to my God, to me. And I said, I, I need a miracle. Yeah. And I will do the footwork. Never said that. I never talked about my part. Right, really committed. And then did my part, <laughs> you know. <Yeah. clears throat> and I got off my knees and the doors flew open. I did four months on a four-year sentence. I got out of prison. Uh, all the cases that I had that I had gotten reinstated on just went away. Mm. All the restitution, gone. I mean, it was a fresh start. I had one year of parole. It was nothing. Mm-hmm. Got right back into recovery, AA. Going to meetings every day, you know, doing it, doing the deal, doing it the way you're described. And you found good support there. I'm, oh, I'm, yeah. Yeah. I found people that had what I wanted. Mm-hmm. They were able to really do it and not, you know, to stay sober. Yeah, that was you were shocking seeing success, me. right. Yeah. And just immersing myself in that. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I talk with these guys a lot about at the prison where I go and also on the job is that you have to just flush your old life. Mm-hmm. All of it. You go to a barber shop enough times, you're going to get a haircut. Mm-hmm. So that's what I did. I just lived at the at the AA club in Kansas City where I'm from, did that for a couple of years, and uh, and then I was asked to come back into the family business, and that's why I moved to St. Louis. Interesting. So when you came back into the family business, were, was who all was involved in the family business at that time? So <clears throat> for, for years. Like was, how, many, how long had it been? Like since you went out of the family business and coming back into the so family that would have business. been um, probably about seven years. I okay, so it'd been a while. Yeah, yeah. Got kicked out. Went to became a framing carpenter. Yeah, which a lot of these, you know, that's sort of a magnet for alcoholics sure. and addicts because there's no accountability. Yeah, you get fired and you walk across the street and work there. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but I always when I when I talk about this and I and I do often. Um, I didn't get asked to come back into the family business on day one. Mm. It was 18 months after, after I was you put out, in all the work after I was out. Yeah. I went back to carpentry from prison, went back to the same job, the same boss. Where were you living? Kansas city. I know, but like, where were you living? <clears throat> like, were you, you're not living with your parents or are you, are you, it was usually I was living with it. You know, when I was partying and doing all that. No, I mean, when you got out, you're, you're, you're on your recovery. When I got out, I paroled and home plan to my sister's house. Okay. And within two weeks of being there, I recognized that I got, I had to get out of there. It was be insane. your own thing. So I went up to the AA club, posted, I need a roommate. By the end of that meeting, I had a place to live. The reason I ask you that is because <laughs> I think that's such an important step too. If you find, you know, th- that, that midway point where you're needing support, want to be on your own, how do you get there? You went and posted, and, and you went with somebody who was part of that group. That's true, but the, that's not the reason. No? The reason is that I was doing the footwork. You were doing the footwork, Once right? Once I started doing the footwork and taking the action and doing the things I needed to do to address the issues that caused me to go to prison yeah. and caused me to have all the difficulties in my life. Once I started doing my part, things just started kind of falling, falling in into my place. Lap. Yeah. I mean, it was just talking about that with a guy. I mean, it was shocking to me how fast my life got. Things good. happen. Yeah. Okay. So you w- let's talk a little bit about how, cause there's been some time between all this, but you, when was it that you found this passion for, Constructing futures, like, because you were in the furniture business, and but you have this background, being able to be 
and construction and renovation. When did you put all that together? So um, the passion really began for me um, as a result of what we're called to do. Part of that footwork is to carry the message, Mm -hmm. have a service commitment. That's one of the mandates, not mandates, but it's one of the guidelines of the few things you have to do when you're in recovery. Mm -hmm. And the obvious thing for me would be to carry a message back to the place where I had my experience. Sure. So when they let me out of prison, I had one year of parole. I couldn't do anything related to that for that one year. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was doing things. I was going to treatment centers and speaking, just Mm. doing that, speaking to kids, telling my testimony, even though it was a short one. What was your message? What I'm telling you today. Yeah. Which is got to put the work in. You got to do the footwork. Mm -hmm. And that it's not a willpower thing. Everybody right. thinks it's about willpower. It's not, it's not that. Um, I say to those guys out at the prison, not wanting to go come back to prison will not necessarily keep you from coming back to prison. Yeah. So you got to change. There, there was a guy I had on, uh, he went to the prison when he was 15 years old. And he talks about that exact thing that just to, to avoid coming back to prison isn't going to save you from coming back to prison or make you a better person. You have to be a better you, and and that's the change. Not if you go back to prison or not. You become a better you, and, sure. and that's what is uh, the overall evolution of who you are, not coming back, but just being that person. And so how that happens, right? It's the greatest piece of wisdom that I heard in recovery was – that when we were drinking and using, we always try to think our way into right action. Mm. Recovery teaches us to act our way into right thinking. Mm -hmm. And as I think about that, and I remember thinking about that, it's like clearly my thinking is messed up because my best thinking, my way, gets me locked up. (laughs) Right? (laughs) So if I can admit that. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good point. (laughs) Then I say, okay, how do I know what right action is? Mm -hmm. I have a mentor, a sponsor, wise counsel, people that I'm bouncing things off that can say, whoa, no, that's not, I wouldn't do that. I would do this and follow that. Yeah. And the coolest thing about that I found in the beginning was I didn't even have to want to. If I just took the action, even if I really didn't want to do it, I'd still get the result. Yeah. And if I look to kind of circling back to what we started off with, the Mm -hmm. reason being, and I think it's the underlying cause of everything in humanity is how we view ourselves. Sure. Right? The insecurity was healed and changed. I acted my way into loving myself through the service part of yeah. recovery, at giving back, helping people sacrificially. You know, it's great to organize chairs in the meetings and empty the ashtrays yeah. back when they had ashtrays, but that's kind of, you're already there, right? That's yeah. kind of the training wheels, some point. You need to get out. In fact, I don't even sponsor guys who won't do service work Mm -hmm. because I know there won't be any real deep, meaningful change without I just saw you do it here today. Uh, We were right before we got started. um, Lynn, who works with us here, uh, was telling you about a guy that just gotten out and, and needs support. And you just, you know, whipped out your card and said, give him, have him give me a call. And, you know, but that, that type of, because I want to get into, I, I think that you've got to get so really fills you up from what you're doing because these guys that you're helping right now with constructing futures, I'm assuming a lot of these guys don't know how to do carpentry work, that you're actually putting them into, and they probably don't even know it. You're putting them into your world, your system, and they're taking the steps that you're talking about. And that's the whole program. Mm -hmm. So how did this start? So, you know, after parole, um, 18 months into, after I got out of prison, I was asked to come back into the family furniture business and move to St. Louis. That's what brought me here. Yeah. I grew up in Kansas city. And so I came here and we had a little furniture store down here by Tucker's at 141. Yeah, that's exactly where that is. There's a bar, there's a salon there now. Yeah. So my brother-in-law and my dad sort of splintered off. He came here and opened that store, but he would come on the weekends. He couldn't come every, you know, all week. So Mm -hmm. he needed help. I seemed like I had gotten my act together, Mm -hmm. you know, and I really stressed that too. And the good thing is they did need help. They did need help. Yeah. 
I stress, and I always make a point to say, I was asked to come into the business 18 months after I was out, not day one, not week one, mm-hmm. not week, month one. You know, these things take time. I never once, I was just telling that same guy before he came in here, um, I've never chased anything except mm-hmm. focusing on my recovery. Everything just shows Everything else up. worked. It's a byproduct. Yeah. It's a residual byproduct. This thing, sitting here with mm-hmm. you, is part of my vision that I didn't go looking for this, that right. just fell in my lap through being connected, yeah. through doing good stuff, meeting people, yeah. and then it, that's how. Well, I mean, it's like Ronnie said, you got to you got to meet this guy, Rick. He's just he's just doing incredible things, and and I, that's what I love about this podcast is is how many different connections we were talking about this before uh, across the United States, the the connections of people who are doing really good stuff, breaking the narrative. That all these guys can't do anything, and they all go back. That's not true. Some people doing some good stuff. Yeah. Well, so um, you know, having uh, been asked to come into the business and come back and run the furniture store and back in sales, yeah, um, that lasted about eight years, and then the economy got kind of bad, and in the furniture business, they started. Um, imports started coming in Mm -hmm. and that competition really kept us from being able to be very successful and it was just the 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 season it was time for me to make another move but once i got a parole and moved to st louis i would talk every time i go to a meeting i'd look for the corrections chairperson Mm -hmm. how do you how do i get back into prison i started trying to get into pacific down Mm -hmm. here mecc couldn't do it gotta be you're supposed to be off paper so-called mm-hmm. paper for five years. Mm-hmm. So I set that aside and I started going down. I could do the county jail stuff. So yeah. I started, I started with the old, uh, the old county jail in St. Louis before they built a new one. Yeah. I remember that first time. Walking what was that in, like? Oh, it's nobody's going to be able to understand. You, maybe you could understand. Well, it's, the county jail is such a transient environment anyway. Just the idea that I had spent m- most of my life being locked going up. Going in and out. Yeah. And being able to go in there freely with a, something about having that walkie-talkie in my hand, mm-hmm. walking in there with a big book, it was like unbelievable feeling. Mm-hmm. And I was hooked. So I did that a few times. And then, I, I mean, I got to tour the new county jail before there was inmates. I got to go in the cells and yeah. lay down. And I was telling the guy this the other day. I actually went in one of the cells and laid down and imagined that I was in there again. Yeah, You know, a lot of guys... This is where I, I commend you because I have friends who've done time. Yeah. They don't want any part of this. Yeah. I want to talk about it. They want to forget it. Yeah. When the truth is, it's where the deepest, most yeah, I think it's very liberating yeah. thing that you can. Why? Because it's where your experience is. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so, um, and to be fair, I, I was only in prison two months. I could see if you did five, 10 years. Like, that being a different Well, but vibe. you were in and out. That, that's the other thing. Yeah, you were in for two months, but you were in and out a lot. Sure. So you, you got to experience a lot of different occasions of uh, what that feels like. Well, I could see the writing on the wall. I could see that I was heading towards a big prison sentence. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, once you get in that ringer, you, there's nothing you can do. Talking, mm-hmm. nothing, you're, no, you have no power. Right. And every time that door would slam behind me, and it slammed a lot, first thought I would have is how do I keep forgetting how bad this is? Mm -hmm. And that's the powerlessness of it, right? The impulsivity of the way I was living my life. But until one, these guys go in and do business with why they continue to have these struggles, Mm -hmm. everything else is a bandaid. Right. And that's what constructing futures is. Right. So I'm taking them, doing the meetings in the County jail for years. Mm -hmm. And then when Katrina hit, so Katrina hit, I don't know. I don't remember the year, but I had been going into the prisons for probably ten years before that. Mm-hmm. So I had a heart for this, you know, before that. <clears throat> and when I went down to New Orleans, um, you know, you go with a church group. It's volunteers. It's mm-hmm. thirty people. The church vans, you know, yeah, driving see them down. show up, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, first thing they do is they have pull everybody together and they say, "Who's a contractor?" Couple guys raised two, three guys raised their hand. I'm like, you, you know what that means. You're yeah. now the team leader. Sure. Take these five people over to this address mm-hmm. and you're gonna hang drywall or you're gonna paint or whatever you're gonna do, whatever the stage that house is in. 
And very quickly, I saw I'm teaching like bankers, housewives, yeah. car salesmen how to do how to tape in mud or how to. I thought I could do this with guys uh-huh. coming out of prison. Um, at that point, I had left. That's the interesting. The genesis of that idea yeah. was a Katrina. You had yeah. being a team leader down there. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Wow. And so, <clears throat> um, at that point, I had left the family. The family fit business was over. That ended. And I, uh, f- me and a buddy started flipping houses. He was the money side. I was the work worker side, the contractor side. And even though we had a lot of money, in two years of working with him, we bought one house. I basically rehabbed his two of his houses and okay. learned everything that I didn't know. Mm-hmm. I got paid to learn. I'd go to Lowe's. And at that time, you had l- licensed plumbers working in the plumbing aisle. Yeah. And so I just, there was... Many men who I could look to that really played a part in teaching me. Mentoring you. Into yes, this. Yeah. absolutely. And I think that's a big tip too, Rick, is that um, those answers are out there. If, if you if you look in, or in the right area, you know, it's, I always say if you, if you find somebody that's getting it right and they know what they're doing, it's like getting the answers to the test before the test. If you just ask them and you just are open and kind of humble yourself into that and, and find the answers and just plug it into that system that you're working on. Sure. And it, it goes. If you got to be able to take action though. It's all about doing the footwork. Yeah. It's about just get, getting out and doing the footwork. Yeah. Maybe not even knowing where you're going, but just talking, asking questions. And that's what I did. And as a result of, in my opinion, finally in my life, addressing and doing business, what I needed to address and do business with, mm-hmm. all these things got put in my life. And so <clears throat> I got paid well for to, in working with him for mm-hmm. two years. And then from there, I ended up, a friend of mine in recovery, he and I and another guy partnered up, and we bought some rental properties. I left that one guy, left my friend, and now, you know, I that's when my company started. <clears throat> and then how did these guys find out? How did you let the word out that this is something for reentry, something for guys that uh, are looking for an opportunity? How did how the word get out? So I called and met with probation officers and parole officers. Love it. I got 15 of them in my phone, which is so ironic. It is. And hilarious. Because those are the people you were fearing and they're coming after you. Well, there's so much more this we'll get into. <laughs> yeah. I actually have the warden's cell phone. That's why I just talked to him two days ago about getting a guy in to come to the meeting who's in town, who's a sponsee of mine in recovery, mm-hmm. 17 years clean. Mm-hmm. And I just got his cell phone. And I mean, we're talking like you and I are talking. Yeah. I get. <laughs> but that's I, cool though, that he's, he, he's the warden and he's looking for solutions too. Cause there's, there's a lot of that where that's not necessarily the case. No, right? no. That's a good thing. This place. What's funny about Pacific MECC mm-hmm. is I came to St. Louis on Amtrak two years before I went to prison on a business trip, quote unquote, to train some people on how to do what we were doing, sell furniture. That was my dad's sort of big concept. Mm-hmm. Train them how to sell. Set, to how to do it. And yeah. so I, that train drove right past that prison. Wow. And that was seven years before I ended up yeah. getting, getting clean and getting, you know, my life together. Yeah. The guy was a guard there. So just the irony of some of these things is that amazing. Is pretty ironic. <clears throat> so um, I had been going out there doing an NA meeting for many years. I st- what I started doing, I've got the POs, and, and I met with them, mm-hmm. told them what we were about. And I would just, you know, I'd call them and say, I need a guy. And, you know, they would come. They would, I'd do it on my own. I didn't have the 501c3 yet. Mm-hmm. I was just doing it on my own. It was evolving. Under my company, yeah. working with one guy at a time, small. Mm-hmm. It's still not, you know, where I want it to be because of we're, we're newly a fu- not-for-profit yeah. funding and all that kind of stuff. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's that pretty much how I've got where I'm at with it. So these guys that come on, let's talk about that because they – you're – you're more or less mentoring them into their world of, of getting to the next step. Cause you were saying, and I think it's such an important thing when you're talking to these guys, like uh, uh, you mentioned a couple of different businesses and you say, Hey, do you hire, you know, ex felons? If somebody has been, no, 
no. But then you, you don't stop there. You talk about how you vetted this and who this person is and how eager they are. You want this person. I think that's an incredible thing because we're not just talking about that you are teaching guys, you know, how to construct uh, and, and, and move forward. You're, you're out there fighting for them to move on to the next stage. And that's a piece that, that uh, you know, a lot of that, we need more of that. We need more of that because those guys need that extra, whatever that is, because they're fighting through this and they they know. I mean, anybody who's been through that process of prison knows that whenever you go to that job interview, you're going to have to fight. I don't know what the percentage is more, but a lot more because they're they're not used to you. And who who are you? A prison creature? Somebody who's been in prison? What? How, why would we hire somebody? We were scared of you. The stigma. Sure. The stigma. Yeah. Well, that's why, you know. And you're knocking the stigma off of that. Yeah. That's a well, big you deal. and I were talking prior to, to starting up here about, um, you know, this sort of pie chart that I developed. Yes. Like where yeah. you have what I, I've sort of put it into three groups, right? You know, having gone to the prison, having been in prison, yeah. and then having gone down there now for 22 years, and having been hiring guy, you know, I have a lot of experience with this. I've lived it. I've been around it. There's a, there's a percentage of men, it's small, that are have no interest in what you're doing. There's nothing you're going to do to change them. I'm, this is not for them. I bet you can tell those guys pretty quickly. Very quickly. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. One, they're not in my meetings. Yeah. Right? So that's the yeah. first giveaway. Right. Um, and then there's another piece of the pie that's, you know, a little bigger, maybe not, you know, as, as small as the other one, but it's the group of men who say they want to change, but they're looking for a handout. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they, they, in their mind, they might believe they want to change, but they really don't want to do the work. Right. Right. They're the what, lazy what, walkers. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> what, and these are guys that, you know, have this victim mentality, which yeah. I had. Everybody else's. Yeah. Blame. Yes. Blame I fingers. had this too. Takes yes. all your, takes all your strength away. Yeah. So that's you take those two small pieces and what you're left with is the is the majority. Yes. Which is a large percentage of men who if someone would just come alongside them and show them that they believe in them, yeah. not hand Give them, them some anything, confidence. right? Not yeah. hand them anything. I go to a story this I go to the same story every time. I had a kid working for me who didn't have a tape measure, needed one. <clears throat> and I had one. I had an extra one. I was never going to touch it again. Try it was in the Bottom of the toolbox. Mm-hmm. I dug it out. I gave it to him, and I said, I'm taking $5 out of your check. Mm-hmm. I don't need the $5. But the principal there. He's in the game. He's he committed. come in to work the next day, rides the bus. He was like a different guy. He said people were asking him about this tape measure. Yeah, are, you a, are you a carpenter? <laughs> are you a contractor? He yeah. just filled up. Yeah. Because, you know, what my message is is, you know, one, we have to really define why what we're doing isn't working. Otherwise, it won't stop. Mm-hmm. And then if you're going to do that, you better be ready to have a solution, which I have. Mm-hmm. I have a formula that works. I've lived it. We could talk the rest of the day about guys that have come through who their lives have changed because they've been held accountable. Mm-hmm. They've been loved on, but they've not been enabled. Mm-hmm. And they've had people around them, such as myself and others, who have been there. Mm-hmm. that's the biggest key is having, because these guys just don't listen to people unless they've been there. True. Even though they're telling them the right thing, you got to have that. Some component. street cred, right? Exactly. Yeah. You're saying this guy has been there. He's been able to overcome. He knows what he's talking about. Yeah. So we call it our, we call it the formula. It's a formula for success. It's, it's mostly about clean, being clean and sober. Do you that's have other thing. guys that you've worked with that help other guys? I do. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a guy who um, came to my, I found him actually through, my wife's from Argentina. Mm-hmm. And we've been together 11 years. She's been here uh, eight, 10 years. Okay. And when she moved here, <clears throat> it was very difficult for her to, I mean, she could speak pretty decent English, yeah. but leaving her family was really hard yeah. on her. And, you know, I'm off at work. She's at home all day. She had never driven a car at that point in her life. So she's sitting at the house 
And I'm like, okay, this isn't going to last very long if we don't. So first thing he does about our dog. Uh, second thing, for me, it's always been about how do I feel better about my situation? Go help somebody. Get out of myself, yeah. right? So I picked up the phone and started calling a couple friends, pastor friends of mine. What can we do? What kind of service work can we do together? Mm -hmm. So we end up meeting uh, Terry Stepanovich. Her husband, Steve Stepanovich, mm -hmm. played... Yeah, he's just basketball. met my high school. Yeah. So Terry Stepanovich met her. She had a ministry at the time called Faith That Works. Mm -hmm. And they had this little thing going down, uh, this ministry down in the trailer park down there behind Chesterfield Mall. Yeah, yeah. A Hispanic outreach. So How cool my, is that? My wife and I, yeah, you can see where this is coming. Yeah. So my wife and I go on a Sunday to talk to her and – we walk in there, and she's telling him about these two trailers and the work that needs to be done, and I'm there to possibly help her with some of that. Mm -hmm. And this uh, Mexican gentleman walks in and starts speaking Spanish, and my wife translated, and you could see my wife just like, like plugged in, fill up. Yep. She, my wife ended up working there. That's so cool. Uh, for the ESL classes and watching kids. Sure. And it was so it was so. <clears throat> Connected that, to the dots. When that first meeting rat was wrapping up, um, I was looking for a card. I didn't have any Arrowhead contracting cards. I, all I had was constructing futures. So, of course, I'm handing it to her and giving her the elevator sure. pitch. Everybody. <laughs> Why I, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. Everybody that knows me, that's all I talk about. <clears throat> um, and she said, you know, my brother just got out. Mm. And he's sitting over here at my aunt's. I'm really worried about him. He's isolating. He's only been out a couple months. I said, well, have him call me. Yeah. I didn't call him, just like I didn't ask yeah. her. Have him call me. Have him call me. That's that first step. Right. <clears throat> he did, and I ended up sponsoring him, and um, we found out very quickly that we had a lot of the same interests, sports. Mm -hmm. He's a golfer. I'm a golfer. Started playing golf together. I hired him. Mm -hmm. He's been with me now 10 years. Wow. He His story is hilarious, and, and I'll, I'll – Give you his number. He, I'm sure he'd be. Oh yeah, he'd be a on. good guest. Um, <clears throat> he said, "When I went out, he said, if you'd have told me when I went out that Friday night that I wasn't going to come home for five years, mm. I never would have believed." <laughs> 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 you know, he'll, and he'll tell you, he got a police chase, and you know, off, yeah, no, well, off, gone, throw away the key. Um, but this guy has he's become my pal. Yeah, I always wanted a pal. He's yeah. my pal, and uh, I mean, he he's my right hand man. He's running stuff. He's doing That's things great. for constructing futures. He's at the point where he could go have his own company, sure, and double his income. Yeah, I could. I could triple my income. Well, I was going to ask you that. What? What's? What's your? Because I, you know, you've got you've got all the pieces here. What? What do you? What do you want this to grow up and be? The vision. If it would all, if it would all be what you wanted it to be. The conf the vision for constructing yeah. futures is to have men who previously been incarcerated yeah. um, rehabbing and renovating the blighted areas of St. Louis. Yeah. There's 500 plus buildings that the city owns that are just sitting there, just sitting there. Now they're not all, <clears throat> I mean, you can't say it's 500, it's probably 250, 300. That's still a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. And if you think about the idea of affecting recidivism yeah. and cleaning up these areas of St. Louis, where so you can when for everybody. housing, possibly create housing for the very men that, that need it. Right. Yep. <clears throat> so that's the ultimate goal. And, uh, I don't, you know, I've committed my life to this. Uh, oh, I can tell you got a real passion for it. And I, I just, it's things like the, the reason I ask you what your ultimate goal is because these are the type of things, Rick, if they're duplicated and this is something that could duplicate beyond St. Louis, uh, it's got some real, it makes a lot of sense. And, and I think there's so many people that could, could get into this and, and if they followed the program and, and, and the steps and, and took the actions that need to be, there's so many success that could come, so many people that could be successful coming out of it. And it, it's uh, just keep going with it. I, I want to ask you, because I always ask everybody this, because you've, you've had such a varied, you know, you, you've had this roller coaster journey and you found your way. Uh, what do you think is your biggest takeaway through all this to the guys listening out there, people listening out there? Find 
where you have your experience and let God use you in that realm, whether it's voluntarily or as your career, mm -hmm. and you will, you, you'll never be happier. Yeah, that's good <clears throat> stuff. I mean, you're really just saying you need to find your passion. And then put your put your energy into it, and you know your skill set, Rick, is unique, and I think that's what makes you so good. You you have a unique skill set that you can talk to a lot of people about things that they want to hear about, and then you've got something that you can actually plug them into, and you put those two pieces together. That 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 affects stuff. That's that creates momentum. So good for you, man. I like yeah. it. I, I, when Ronnie told me about you and what you were doing, I said, man, I got to talk to him. That, that, that's the kind of stuff. And that's the reason why we have this podcast is, is that, you know, what happens when your worst fear comes to reality? What do you do? How do you adapt? How do you survive? And you, you changed and flipped the script. You went from victim to survivor and then plugged in all the things you needed for that. So good stuff, Rick. Anything I didn't ask you that we, we, we've that I missed no I mean I guess the the what I would say <clears throat> um in hope that people hear is that um I've been doing this long enough now to have a real understanding as to why what we're doing is not working yeah there's basically um I don't know the last time I checked 80 billion dollars a year mm -hmm. going to this to corrections yeah and instant it's an industry it's an industry yeah. and so Throwing money at things doesn't isn't necessarily the isn't necessarily the way we our motto at constructing futures is saving neighborhoods, rehabbing people. I love that. So it's a holistic approach a that whole holds piece. many holds men accountable that that will affect change. Yeah. And if if we could bring that if we could somehow reduce that number down to what is costing the average taxpayer. Yeah. Then you might get people to start saying, "What can we do?" Well, here's the thing, Rick, I, and I think this is the piece in, in us sitting here talking about this. You take eighty billion dollars, and I think you need more people like you, Rick, that that are out there that are part of the solution, sitting at the table, and those dollars are spent knowing because you've lived it and you're working in it that. That's how things get done. That's how solutions happen. So many people are spending those dollars that have no idea what the outcome will be. And they don't care what the outcome is because they just get more dollars to spend. And they don't see or look for any solutions. It just is another annual budget. Well, plus you also, what you add to that is the level of crime. Yeah. And the difficulty in, you know, it makes things cost more. Yeah. It's, everything comes down to, you know, this affects... Crime rate. Yes, absolutely. You get guys to stop committing crimes, yeah. that's a good thing. It's a great thing for society. <laughs> absolutely. Rick, how do people get a hold of you? If somebody wants to reach out to you, what's the best way to, to get in contact with you? Uh, my website would be uh, constructingfuturesstl.org would be the best way to get in touch with me. Yeah, and I'll put that in the, the uh, episode description too. Uh, for those out there... Um, Still looking for a book to read. I wrote one, Nightmare Success. You can get that at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Walmart. Uh, love uh, every week, you guys, the uh, likes and feedback that I get with the comments. It's always good. Um, and and if you want to know and get any more information about me, brentcasty.com, leave me a message there. Uh, and anything you need to know there. And it's, remember, I spell it wrong. It's Brent Cassidy, I-T-Y, not the D-Y. Um, and if you could, please go to the Apple reviews. It's, it's, um, if you leave a review, you just scroll down the, the, the page there, leave a review. It just pumps the steroids into, uh, them promoting the show, which is just helps the show overall. Spotify hit the bell, hit the uh, check mark for Apple. Uh, as I used to say to everybody, when I was writing my emails back and forth from prison, stay strong and I'll do the same. Rick Gray, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me, Brent. appreciate it. Thank you for what you do. I appreciate that. Love it. Nightmare Success, send it out. We'll talk to you later.